the topic of my lecture will be some research I've conducted uh, uh, over the last six or seven years, actually, on two entries from Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. And this research was conducted with Sun Kim and Alexander's Our Rescue. Sun Kim, as a former student, co-advised by Kevin Ford and myself, and uh, she graduated a year ago. Um, she now has a one-year position at Penn State, but will assume a three-year postdoc at Ohio State uh, in the fall. She's probably the best female student in number theory we've ever had at the University of Illinois. And Alexander's Our Rescue is my very capable and brilliant colleague of Illinois. Well, we had Chan as a former student of mine. He's responsible for the numerical calculations that I'll give you at the end of the lecture. So I thought I would uh, begin with this quote from Viveka Chudamani uh, from the sixth century. I'm sure he was speaking about uh, these two entries in Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. Uh, indeed, they are very mysterious entries. Let me just begin by paying homage to Ramanujan. This is the one of the four photographs that exist of Ramanujan. It's the famous passport photo taken when just prior to his coming back to India from and he was, was too ill at that time to go to, to the photographers to have his picture taken. The photographer had to come to the nursing home. And so he's actually photographed here in his pajamas and bath, bathroom. This information comes from me to, uh, comes to me from Robert Rankin, who was Hardy's last PhD student. So here are the two entries. Uh, uh, from the Lost Notebook. Technically, this page is not in the Lost Notebook. When the Lost Notebook was published in 1988 for the first time, they published, along with the original Lost Notebook as found by George Andrews, a number of other fragments and partial manuscripts that they could find at the library at Trinity College, Cambridge, and at Oxford University. And this is just one of these fragments. It's just a one page fragment containing these two formulas. So you don't need to strain your eyes. I will give them to you in a LaTeX version. <coughs> so um, they both involve this function uh, f of x, the greatest integer function. If x is not an integer, and x minus a half, if x is an integer. Actually, Ramanujan uses the notation square brackets x for f of x, but that's bit unconventional, so I changed the notation slightly. So in other words, we're averaging out the discontinuities here with the definition of f. And um, to remind you of the definition of ordinary vessel functions. So here is the first formula, and I'll spend most of my lecture on this first formula. So theta is between 0 and 1, x is positive, and we've just defined f of x and the vessel function j1. Then Ramanujan states this uh, identity here um, involving a doubly infinite series of vessel functions. So let me try to convince you that uh, uh, this is a very interesting identity. So note that the sum on the left-hand side, the trigonometric sum, is really a finite trigonometric sum because if you fix x, then for n sufficiently large, f of x over n is clearly going to be zero. So uh, for one thing, this theorem says that, or this entry says that this double series of vessel functions plus this, these other more elementary functions has a finite Fourier series, something of course you would never guess from looking at this. And also there must be some singularities at zero and one in this series because the cotangent has singularities at 0 and 1, and we don't have any singularities on the left-hand side, so somehow the singularities are canceling each other out. And if um, you have some familiarity with the circle problem, um, you will notice that these vessel functions are very much like those connected 
with the circle problem, and I'll make that very concrete in just a moment. Well, it's not obvious that that double series converges. So here is uh, just the simple asymptotic formula for vessel functions as x tends to infinity. So as m and n tend to infinity in the double sum, then the, the series then turns uh, look like this, roughly. So because of the three-quarter powers here on the m and the n, uh, it's possible that the series, the double series, will converge conditionally, but certainly not absolutely. The fact that the m and n are intertwined together under a square root sign in the trig functions uh, makes the convergence very difficult to show. In fact, this is the reason why we had trouble for years uh, actually proving these, this formula and the next formula because the convergence is very uh, touchy and uh, uh, it's not obvious at all. So let me now show you the connection between this and the circle problem. So I'll assume that uh, you do not have any familiarity with the circle problem, so I'll describe it in detail. So we let R2 of n be the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares, and we count different signs in different orders as being distinct. Uh, so for example, R2 of five is equal to eight because five is two squared plus one squared, but you can alter the signs of the two and one in four different ways, and you can change the order in two different ways. So each of these representations of n as a sum of two squares can be associated with a lattice point in the plane. For example, if you take 5 as minus 2 squared plus 1 squared, you associate that with the lattice point minus 2, 1. And then each lattice point can be associated with a unit square. And it doesn't make any difference which of the four possible unit squares we take. We'll take the unit square such that it's uh, the lattice point is in the southwest corner, say. Okay, so if we then look at the lattice points in a circle of radius square root x, and then associate uh, each uh, of these lattice points with a square going in the northeast direction, uh, this is the uh, type of figure that we get here. So if we want to uh, sum, say, R2 of n, the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares, for over all n less than or equal to x, then that's equivalent to summing over all lattice points in this circle of radius square root x, and that's the same numerically as the sum of the areas of these squares. So if you take the sum of the areas of the squares, that should be about equal to the area of the circle. But of course, not exactly equal. Okay, so we'll write then the sum of r2 of n over n less than or equal to x as the area of that circle, pi times x, and there will be an error term, p of x. Now here, the prime on the summation sign indicates that um, if x is an integer, we only count one half of the term. And if you're not an analytic number theorist, you might say, well, this seems a bit strange. But uh, in analytic number theory, when we use complex or Fourier analysis, uh, this is the natural sum that uh, arises there. And I've included zero because zero corresponds to the origin. Okay, so we have an error term p of x, and the, this is the content of the circle problem. What is the order of p of x as x tends to infinity? And uh, this is an unsolved problem. It's a very famous unsolved problem, and the first person to examine this was Gauss. So he argued as follows. Now certainly uh, r of x is, uh, or all these points, are going to be contained within a circle of radius square root x plus square root two. So an upper bound for r of x is uh, going to be pi square root x plus square root two squared. Um, then clearly from my picture, um, 
If you take a circle of radius square root x minus square root 2, that'll entirely be covered red. Yeah. So you get a lower bound then by taking pi times square root x minus square root 2 quantity squared. Okay, and then from these inequalities, you get that r of x is pi x plus big O of square root x as x tends to infinity. So that's the first estimate we have on the famous circle problem that uh, p of x is big O of square root x. Yeah. Well, the next uh, person to examine this problem was Sierpinski in 1904. So Sierpinski, Landau, Hardy, and Ramanujan actually proved this identity uh, for the summatory function. So in other words, the error term p of x is given by this infinite series of Bessel functions. So in the, Hardy wrote two papers on the circle problem, and in the first, he actually says Ramanujan told him of this formula. So at that point, he did not know of Sierpinski's earlier result. And uh, so and it's doubtful, actually, that Ramanujan had seen Sierpinski's theorem. So uh, he obviously had also proved this formula for the summatory function. Yeah. So again, I'll just remind you of the definition of Bessel functions. Yeah. So, uh, Sierpinski showed then that p of x is big O of x to the one third. So the idea then is to take j1 of 2 pi square root nx, replace it by the first term in the asymptotic formula, the other terms in the asymptotic expansion for Bessel functions will contribute something of lower order of magnitude. It's uh, easy to show that. and. So then the problem boils down to uh, estimating the trigonometric sum that you get when you use the first term in the uh, asymptotic expansion for Bessel functions. And since that time, virtually all efforts at finding an upper bound for the error term have rested upon exactly this formula of Sierpinski and estimating the trigonometric sums that arise. So that's, that's how things have proceeded in the last 100 or so years. Try to estimate the trigonometric sum in the best way that you can. So let me just uh, give you a summary of all the results that have been achieved uh, in, from above for estimating P of X. So I actually put an epsilon here uh, to indicate that in some cases, uh, there's a log factor, something like this, multiplying the, uh, the power of x. Yeah. So, I mean, you're not going to read this, all of this, but let me just point out that progress is slow. As we go down to the left column, and the only thing I want to indicate on the right column is that a lot of people, many that you have heard of, um, Gauss, Landau, Hardy, uh, Chen, for example, have worked on this problem. And there are three more results. Yeah. So I think that, as far as I know, maybe uh, your director, Professor Bala Subramanian, knows of any further result, but I think this is the latest result by Exley that uh, the P of X is big O of X to the 131 over 416. So we've uh, in over 100 years, we've gone from 0.33 to a little better than 0.31. Okay, well, let's look at the problem from below. And this is actually what Hardy did. So I introduced the uh, omega notation that we use in number theory frequently. So let me just give the first of these three definitions. So g of x, this is the function that we want to examine and find out how fast it grows. Small g of x is something which is simpler. So we say that um, camp g of x is omega of small g if there is some constant k such that camp g is bigger than k times small g on some sequence of xn's tending to infinity. Of course, not all sequences, but some sequence. Okay, so this then, uh, would, in, if you have an omega result, this will give you a lower bound then for the error term. 
Okay, so uh, this is what Hardy did in his two papers. He first showed that p of x is omega plus or minus x to the one quarter. Then he improved this to x log x to the one quarter. So these next two improvements are only on the plus side, uh, plus side of the estimate. That is by Gagadurin and uh, Karabi and Katai. And then uh, the first improvement on Hardy's result um, really did not come until 1981. Uh, Jim Hafner was my PhD student, and he showed, uh, got an improvement by essentially adding a log log uh, uh, factor with the power of log two over four. And we should give Atlee Selberg some credit here because this came about um, from uh, a conversation I had with Selberg a few years earlier. Um, he said that he had improved upon Hardy's result, but he had never published his result. And so he showed me, just indicated, that, told me in one or two sentences what he had done. So I remembered these sentences and passed them on to Jim Hafner uh, for his PhD thesis. And with a little correspondence with Selberg, then uh, Hafner proved uh, this result. And then Sandra Arajan, uh, 22 years later, improved Hafner's result. And uh, essentially by improving the power of log log x. So you can see the differences between Hafner and Sandra Rajan's uh, results now. So uh, this is the best we uh, have uh, from lower bound that we have. And the conjecture is that P of x is big O of x to the one quarter plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. So in other words, the the results of Hardy, Hafner, Sounder, Rajan are probably closer to the truth than the upper bounds that we've got. Well, Hardy, in uh, his um, work on the um, circle problem, used not the identity of Sierpinski, but this identity. And then uh, at the end of his uh, I can't remember if it's the first or second paper, he says uh, that Ramanujan showed him this identity. This identity as, is actually not found in Ramanujan's work anywhere else. It's not in any of his published papers or in any of his notebooks. It's a very beautiful identity. Uh, note that in going from the left side to the right side, you just switch the A and the B around. So, so it's not a particularly hard identity to prove, but it is a beautiful identity, I think. Well, if you don't think it's a beautiful identity, I don't think you're a mathematician. I, mean, I think that's a beautiful identity. And um, you can get Hardy's result from this by differentiating with respect to B, letting A tend to zero, and then just renaming the parameters. So I think uh, both of these comments uh, that I made about Ramanujan here, that he had independently found Sierpinski's formula and that he found this identity, I think were indicated, uh, uh, and then also this main theorem, which uh, I will tell you about further, uh, indicate that uh, Ramanujan thought about this circle problem. Well, now let me get back to the first claim uh, I've just restated it here. I haven't made any changes. Um, but it's now a theorem as of early this year. Um, it took us some, several years to working on this, but Sun Kim's RSQ and I finally proved, uh, proved this result. And it's the longest proof I've ever been associated with in my career. Just the one proof of this result takes 36 LaTeX type pages. Well, earlier, so Rescue and I were able to prove Ramanujan's result with the order of summation reversed on the right-hand side. So this is a restatement of the theorem, but now you will note I changed the order of summation on the right-hand side. And um, you might say, well, if we prove this earlier, you know, why couldn't we prove this in the way Ramanujan has stated the result? 
because you know m and n are almost the same here. The n is perturbed by theta. The m is not perturbed by theta. You would think that's not such a big deal that you know one if I prove the if you prove the theorem this way, you should be able to prove it the other way. But that's not the case at all. Um, uh, in fact, nothing from the proof that we gave earlier was used in our most recent proof. And so this, as I said, was we proved um, a few years earlier. And the way we proved it is to actually get rid of the Bessel functions. So we showed that Ramanujan's identity with the order of summation reverse uh, is equivalent to this identity involving trig functions. And no, here you really see how the N and M are really much different. Uh, their roles are now really quite a bit different. And this identity does not hold if you try to invert the order of summation in Ramanujan's uh, result. So then what so rescue and I did at the time is uh, we used Ramanujan's identity to drive sort of a more general theorem involving uh, L functions. And then we used that identity to derive uh, this identity for the summatory function of R2 of M. So now we have our pi x as usual. But now in the Sierpinski result, the uh, infinite series of Bessel functions has been replaced by this doubly infinite series of Bessel functions. Well, you might say, well, that's a complication, but there, what's the, there, there's a difference in that in Sierpinski's result, he has in the sum ends an R2 of n. Here, we don't have the R2 of n in the sum ends. So in one sense, this is a bit simpler, in the, but it's a double series, but in another sense, the Sierpinski result of and the Bessel functions look very much the same. And so you might ask, well, you know, are these uh, identities really equivalent? And uh, they are. And I put equivalence, however, in quotes. So I'll just briefly indicate the argument as to why they're equivalent and why you see quotes along uh, the word equivalence. So the, argu or the argument is not difficult at all. Uh, so Rescue and I just realized that shortly after we published our paper. So we just take the Sierpinski right-hand side and substitute in this familiar formula from Jacobi giving the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares. So we substitute that in and then we just um, break it up into whether into two parts, whether the odd divisors are of the form 4n plus 1, or they're of the form 4n plus 3. Okay, and here I've just uh, simplified, or not simplified, just rewrote this slightly. Well, why did I put equivalence in quotes here? Well, in the original Ramanujan result, and in our uh, theorem that we derive from Ramanujan's result, we had a definite order of summation. N was first, M was second. But now, when we use Jacobi's uh, formula, now the upper limits on M and N are tending to infinity together. So now we've symmetrized the problem, so to speak. We have the M and N going to infinity together. And of course, there's no guarantee that this should give you the same order of summation as if you n tend to infinity first and then m second. Yeah. So that's the reason for putting quotes on the equivalence. Okay, so then we ask ourselves, well maybe uh, since we got this symmetric version of the summatory function identity um, from Ramanujan's result, maybe Ramanujan intended his original result to be viewed in a symmetric version. So I've now re sort of written. Uh, so I have n first and m second, but now the upper index is the same in both cases. In other words, we're tending to infinity, uh, indices are tending to infinity together, so to speak. Okay. 
Okay, and Sun Kim and Zarescu and I have actually now proved the result in this way as, as well, in the symmetric version. And all three give the same formula. So in other words, it shows we can rearrange the order of summation. Okay, so let me just summarize uh, what we have then. We have an iterated double sum where n is first and then we sum on m. This is the way Ramanujan stated the result. And uh, as of January this year, we, we've now proved this. And then we have an iterated double sum where we sum on n first and then n. This is what Cell Rescue and I did about five or six years ago. And then, uh, I think it was last summer, uh, the son, Alexander, and I proved the version in the symmetric, uh, symmetric <coughs> version. So none of our proofs are anywhere like the others. In other words, we use nothing from one proof in any of the other two proofs. So then you might say, can you show the inversion in order of summation, say, directly? I I think it's very difficult. I don't, in other words, I think you sort of have to go through the same kind of, you know, there was just two different kinds of arguments in order to show the uh, inversion in order is justified. Well, let me just briefly sketch the symmetric version, then I'll briefly sketch the version of the theorem and the way Ramanujan had it. And uh, this is where the uh, weighted divisor sums come into the title. Okay, so chi here is a uh, character, primitive character, modulo Q. So uh, d chi of n is the sum of chi of d over all divisors of n. So if that character were the principal character that is 1, uh, then we would have the usual divisor function. This is a Gauss sum. And it's uh, an easy exercise to show that if you replace that trig function by chi of n, that it's the summatory function for d chi of n. Okay, then uh, what we do is to show that, um, and this is not easy to do, that this series of Bessel functions indeed is a continuous uh, function of theta. So it suffices to prove the result for a rational a over q, uh, where q runs through the primes and a and q, uh, or, or a is uh, between zero and q. Okay. So then, uh, we establish this identity for the left-hand side when theta is a over q. So p is uh, the Euler phi function. So note the key here uh, from this formula is that the summatory function for the divisor function, uh, the d chi of n appears here in this identity. So that's a key. Okay, so now with theta equals a over q, uh, the Bessel function series can be written in a little bit simpler form. And then so the, it boils down to proving this identity. That, and I'll stop here, I won't give any, well, I'll give, I guess I do have one or two. The bad thing about using Beamer is that you forget what's coming up next. Okay, well, um, it turns out that an identity for uh, the summatory function of d chi of n, this identity uh, is useful. And uh, I have a question for Balu and anyone else in the audience. I have not seen actually this identity in the literature. It actually follows from a result from my PhD thesis. So you never know when your thesis will be good for you other than just finding a job. So here it was very valuable for me. Uh, I didn't work this out in my thesis, but it is, it is uh, a special case of one of my thesis theorems. And then from this, uh, we get, um, in fact, you can show these are equivalent, uh, this corresponding formula where now on the right hand side we have a double series of um, Bessel functions. So these are the ingredients, the main ingredients uh, in our proof of this symmetric version of Ramanujan's theorem. Now let me just give a sort of an oversimplified view, very brief sketch 
of the proof that we completed just recently. So um, we'll need this elementary evaluation of this integral. This is not trivial, but uh, I might try working it out as an exercise sometime. And we need uh, this integral for uh, the sine and the vessel function. And then we need this very familiar uh, trigonometric series, very familiar to analytic number theorists. We use it very frequently. It's a trigonometric sum for the sawtooth function or the first Bernoulli function. Okay, so we'll let uh, half of theta be uh, most of the right-hand side of the identity that is our double series and the cotangent. Uh, this is a bit oversimplified. We actually have to modify this function a bit. Sorry, the last lemma is how to do it. It's not so difficult. What? The last lemma, I see. The, the last lemma is not difficult to do. That's correct. It's just elementary Fourier series. So what we're going to do is to find the Fourier sine series of this function on 0, 1 half. So I just write out the Fourier uh, sine series. And we substitute in f and invert the order of summation and integration. So here, I've swept everything under the rug because I haven't shown that this series converges yet. And uh, I haven't shown that it converges uniformly. So I can invert this order of summation and integration there. So that's where all the work involved uh, takes place. Okay, so if I do that, this half comes from the first lemma. Because remember, I had a cotangent in my function definition of the function half. Okay, and then I just make some, we just make some simple <coughs> changes of integrals. I won't, uh, or variables here, I won't go into this in any detail. But it does simplify things quite a bit. And now, look, a very nice thing that happens here. Um, these integrals now just add up. And so we get this infinite integral. And now we use our second lemma to evaluate that integral. Okay, so now just going back to our BJ, after doing that evaluation, we get this uh, for our BJs. And we now use the third lemma. And then what I've done is to just simply take the third lemma evaluation and write it in terms of the original function, f. Yeah. Okay, and now we go back to f of theta as the sum of bj sine 2 pi j theta. And we use our bj's, so I've separated what we just calculated into two parts. The part involving f and then the part involving x over j. And now we realize we can use, again, the same trigonometric series. So we actually use it twice in the proof. OK, so that then completes the proof. But uh, as I said, the hard part involving the convergence I have swept under the rug. And we actually have to modify this function a bit. Um, uh, well, let me just say a few words on this convergence. So we begin by just using the asymptotic formula for the Bessel functions. And then we get rid of terms in N which are large compared to M. And uh, so um, it suffices now to look at this sum S2. So in other words, the, when I say get rid of terms, they can be handled easily in the error term. And then we also get rid of those terms where n is small with respect to m. And I put in a minus, a delta here, and that delta is chosen much later in the proof. Then uh, we eliminate the terms between m to the 1 plus delta and m to the cube log m to the fifth. So again, all of these require different types of arguments, but up to this point, not terribly difficult arguments. So now it boils down to looking at this sum, and I just use the trigonometric identity here to now have a product of signs here. 
Okay, so we just use, I, it's just the introduction of a parameter to simplify things. So we just use Cauchy's criterion on this cell. So to examine this sum, we have to break this up into very small squares of size t to the lambda, where lambda is to be chosen later. Square brackets of t to the lambda. Okay, then we ask, also have to separate cases when x is an integer <coughs> and when x is not an integer. The cases when x is not an integer are easier than when x is an integer. Okay, in particular, we have to look at those terms where xm over n or xn over m are both close to being an integer. These are the most difficult terms that we have to estimate. Then we approximate the double sum that if we get these from these main terms by a double integral. We evaluated the integral, and we get a sum of this type where now the other outer integral is of this form. And at this moment, we actually panic a bit because we thought this is not good because uh, now we don't have anything left that's tending to zero, but it turns out that C0 is equal to zero. Uh, you just use the addition formula for the sine, and the integral of the sine from minus infinity to infinity is the same as the cosine, and then you use the fact that the cosine of 3 pi over 4 is minus the sine of 3 pi over 4. And that gives you that C0 is equal to 0. So if C0 did not turn out to be 0, our methods would have collapsed and we wouldn't have gotten the cancellation that we needed. And the 3 pi over 4 was crucial. So that came in from the Bessel function asymptotic expansion. And that Bessel function had a asymptotic expansion and a 3 pi over 8 in it everything would have collapsed, at least in the method that we used. So um, we never dreamed as we were doing all this that the, that 3 pi over 4 would actually be very crucial in the argument. So that's a, a, a brief sketch of uh, our proof then of Ramanujan's formula the way he gave it. Yeah. Okay, so in the last uh, 15 minutes, let me discuss the second formula. And the second formula is, is uh, connected with the famous Dirichlet divisor problem. So we let d of n be the number of positive divisors of the integer n. Then as I will show you, if you look at the summatory function for d of n, the main terms are x times log x plus 2 gamma minus 1, where gamma is Euler's constant. This one quarter just sort of comes in by accident and is, uh, you know, you might say, why don't we put this in the error term delta of x? Analytically, it just pops up and so we just leave it there, so to speak, it's, it's minor, yeah. Okay, so uh, delta of x is the error term. What about the order of this error term as x tends to infinity? So this is a classical <laughs> unsolved problem uh, in number theory. Well, let me just briefly give you Dirichlet's argument. Yeah. Okay, so you can take the summatory function for d of n and write it in an elementary way in terms of the square brackets function. So, what you are doing then, if you use that last representation, is I think you can see we're um, summing uh, lattice points under the hyperbola y z equals x. We're summing them by vertical rows. So what Dirichlet said is, well, why don't we sum up to square root x by vertical rows, and then sum by horizontal rows up to square root x. And then, of course, we cover these lattice points twice in this square of side square root x. So this is what we get. Uh, so here we have one summing by, say, vertical columns, here by horizontal rows. 
okay? Oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. Here by vertical columns, here by horizontal rows, this is our original sum. And then we subtract off then the area of the square, of sine square root x. Well, it's in terms of the lattice points, it's square bracket square root x squared. Now we just replace the square brackets of x over d by x over d, plus big O of 1. And then here, the curly bracket square root x is the fractional part of square root x. So we just assemble all this together. Um, this is what we get. And now we just use a familiar estimate for a partial sum of harmonic series. So that's log square root x plus gamma plus big O of 1 over square root x. And just putting everything together, we get then an error term of big O of square root x. So this is Dirichlet's result. This is the first estimate we have for the error term in the divisor problem. So um, let me state both Voronoi's formula and Ramanujan's formula from the lost notebook. So this involves the Bessel functions y mu of z. It's the second solution of Bessel's differential equation. I actually I haven't given it to you here. And k nu is the, what's called the modified Bessel function. And following Ramanujan, I'm going to let i nu be this uh, difference. Well, Voronoi in 1903 derived this identity for the error term in terms of the Bessel functions i1 and use that identity to show that delta of x is big O of x to the one-third log x. So this was the first improvement on Dirichlet's result. And what he did uh, is what was done analogously for the circle problem by Sierpinski. Uh, um, I'll go back. You just take the asymptotic formulas for y nu or y1 and k1 K1 actually um, decreases exponentially as z tends to infinity. So we, we can really ignore that Bessel function. And the asymptotic formula for y1 is of the same nature as for j1. So the problem boils down to estimating a trigonometric series and all the results that have been obtained from above on the Dirichlet divisor problem since Voronoi have essentially uh, arisen from this identity of Voronoi and replacing the Bessel functions by uh, trigonometric sums. So now let me state then uh, Ramanujan's second formula. So again involves this function f of x. So i1 is this difference of Bessel functions y1 and k1. So again, for x greater than 0 and a theta between 0 and 1, we have uh, this kind of identity. So these are, I should have stated these earlier. These are the asymptotic formulas for the uh, Bessel functions. So uh, again, right-hand side is a doubly infinite series of Bessel functions. We have some singularities at 0 and 1 again. So evidently, because on the left side we have a finite trigonometric sum, it must mean that these singularities are canceling out. The singularities from the log are canceled out from those from the doubly infinite series of the Bessel functions. So again, just as the analytic identity, uh, it's a very interesting identity because one wouldn't guess that the right-hand side would just reduce to a finite trigonometric sum. So this identity is more difficult than the first. And let me just indicate uh, some reasons why that's the case. Well, the Bessel functions k nu and y nu have singularities at the origin. So this uh, causes difficulties. So the four. So before we had a Fourier sine series method. Here we would use Fourier cosine series. The methods work, but additional difficulties arise that didn't arise in the other formula. So in particular, you probably didn't notice that in the first formula, 
we have a difference of Bessel functions, J1 and this. Here, let me go back. Here we have sum of Bessel functions. So there's some cancellation that's taking place in the first formula that's not taking place in the second formula. And so the convergence is slower and things are more, even more delicate. And for a few years, I actually thought the identity was incorrect uh, because the numerical calculations didn't seem to be showing that the um, series was converging. In fact, I'll give some of those later. So that causes difficulty as well. Okay, so first of all, um, we reverse the order of summation like we did uh, about five or six years ago. And uh, uh, it, we now end up, if we reverse the order of summation, uh, getting rid of the Bessel functions but now we get rid of them in a much more difficult formula. And so this is the formula that we get when we get rid of the Bessel functions. That was not nearly as easy as when we got rid of them back in 2005, 2006. Note here that I am combining sums with integrals in each case. So if we uh, took the sums by themselves or the integrals by themselves, they would diverge by themselves. So I have, we have to combine them together. And again, I emphasize we reverse the order. And so Zeta Rescue, Sun Kim, and I have now proved the result with the order of summation reversed, but we've had to add one hypothesis, namely that the double series converges for one value of theta. So if we have it converging for one value of theta, we show that it converges for all values of theta. Now, Zavarescu thinks this is much more interesting than if we had proved the formula without this additional hypothesis. The reason he loves this theorem is because he's never seen a theorem of this type. I mean, I prefer to prove the result as Ramanujan gave it, but with the order of summation reversed, of course. Uh, so to me, this is a defect, but for my colleague Alexandro, he thinks this is good. But, uh, so anyway, we have, first of all, proof of the identity with the order of summation reversed, but with the additional hypothesis here that it converges for one value of theta. So you, you say that it is acceptable theta equals zero? Yeah, it has to be on the open interval from zero to one. Yeah. Okay, so there are three <coughs> possible orders of summation, and let me just tell you uh, what we've done with these. We have the iterated double sum where n is first and then m is second. This is the way Ramanujan stated the result. So I, we are in the process now of proving the result um, the way Ramanujan stated it. In other words, I think the methods that we use in our proof of the first identity are going to work in the second identity, but we haven't carried out all the details yet. Yeah. But I think everything eventually will be, will go over. And then as I just indicated, we also have an int interpretation with an iterated double sum where we sum on M first and then N second. And uh, we've done this with the additional hypothesis. And then we can interpret this symmetrically as we did the first identity. And uh, Sun Kim's our rescue and I improved the identity in this symmetric version. So hopefully when I come back next to uh, lecture at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences here, uh, we'll have completed the first proof. Well, long before I come back the next time. Let me just say a few words about numerical calculations that were done earlier. So uh, L of X theta is everything in the first, in the second identity, except for the double series of Bessel functions. And then my R here, that's a, then a partial sum, that an M and N of this double series of Bessel functions. 
So uh, here are some uh, results where we take small m and then large n, and then we took uh, m large and then n small. And um, it doesn't, uh, you know, some of these are not very promising. So let's look, this is the what we have to aim for on the left-hand side. So let's look here, for example. For a thousand terms, we have a worse estimate than we have for 500 terms. You know, that's not you know, very good for us. Now, this happens uh, more than once. Uh, and uh, there's, there's another table for different values of uh, theta. So the other one was for theta equals a half, I think. So here again, the, oops, here. we got better estimates for 500 terms than we did for 1,000 terms. So it, um, this area is very slow to stabilize. But indeed, we now have shown that indeed that the series does converge. If it converges from one value in theta. Okay, let me just um, complete my uh, lecture by just remarking that uh, our methods have applied to some other sums uh, as well. So we've looked at three different trigonometric sums of this type. So the other two involve a sine and a cosine and two sines. So we have a, an identity. Um, and here I've listed it this way because the, uh, we've proved this identity with the n and m tending to infinity together, not in the way that Ramanujan has stated it. So it's sort of an analog, you might say, a tri trigonometric analog of the Dirichlet divisor problem. So to prove this identity, we look at these uh, weighted divisor sums. Now we have two characters uh, here instead of just one character. They are both of the same modulus or period. Okay, then a key to proving that identity is the following identity for these weighted uh, character sums. So chi 1 and chi 2 are non-principal even characters now, modulo P and Q. Sorry, I said they were the same modulus or different moduli. Then we have this identity for the summatory function of these weighted divisor sums in terms of the Bessel functions I1. So again, I have not seen this identity in the literature. However, it's a corollary of one of the results in my PhD thesis. So if anyone has seen it in the literature, uh, please let me know. And um, we proved the theorem for rational theta and rational sigma. So it boils down then to proving this identity and then we have to use a continuity argument. And then these are the other two sums that we've examined. It turns out that it's not just product of two signs that arises in uh, what we uh, do in the second case, but uh, uh, we have this weighted sum. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with L functions, might not be surprised about this just because functional equation of L functions for odd characters are different than they are for even characters. And so, uh, again, if you're familiar with L functions, this doesn't maybe surprise you that this N and M arrives there. Okay, so I think that's about uh, all I have to say. Let me just uh, con conclude with a photograph of Ramanujan when he was in better health at uh, Cambridge. So thank you very much for attending my lecture. It's the same kind of method that we use uh, when we prove the identity in the symmetric version uh, for, e for the uh, second identity, the second of Ramanujan's identities. Yeah. The, the argument is similar. Yes. So
So, you know, like any mathematician, you know, we spent all this time proving Ramanujan's theorems, and we said to ourselves, well, can we use our ideas to prove something else? And so we were able to prove three further identities. And um, for one of the identities, we've actually also completed a proof uh, with the order of summation uh, iterated as Ramanujan has stated it. This one we haven't done in, in an iterated 